Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Today I wanted to do a video talking about, in my opinion, the saddest and most heartbreaking story in Resident Evil history. Those two words are only a small amount as to what you can describe this story. And looking into my research for this and reading through it, it just keeps on giving me chills knowing about this. And as you guys saw in the thumbnail, this story is about the Trevor family. From George Trevor, Jessica Trevor, and the most known person out of the family, Lisa Trevor. Before we get into it, be sure to leave a like on this video as it helps her reach the YouTube algorithm, and be sure to subscribe to the channel for more Resident Evil content in the near future, and maybe potential lore videos as I am experimenting with them as we speak. And most importantly, thank you guys for watching if you end up doing so. And now, let's get into it. George Trevor was a famous architect from New York whose work became renowned across the world during the 1950s and 60s. He was hired by Oswell E. Spencer in 1962 to design and construct the Arclay Mansion in Raccoon Forest. Curiously enough, he also crafted designs for other of Umbrella's founders, Edward Ashford, for the family's European estate in England. His work for Ashford incorporated many design aspects similar to those Spencer requested in Edward's son, Alexander would go on to model several rooms in the South Pole facility based on Trevor's work to ensure his legacy continued for another generation. Trevor also designed blueprints for a luxury cruise ship which were later used posthumously in the 1970s to construct three identical liners known as the Queen Zenobia, Queen Samaris, and Queen Dido in Resident Evil Revelations. Little is known about Trevor's background history other than he married his childhood sweetheart Jessica in 1949 and lived in New York where his business was based. Four years later, they had their only child, Lisa. Sometime in early 1962, Trevor visited Raccoon City, just a small rural town at the time to meet with Spencer. The rich nobleman had become quite taken with the quaint little town and outlined his vision for a grand mansion as his new home. Trevor listened intently and understood Spencer's request would be difficult to realize and would take all of his integrity and energy to accomplish. Spencer also expressed a desire the building be fitted with many unusual secrets that only he and Trevor would know about. Money was no object and Trevor suddenly found himself faced with a dream project and the biggest challenge of his career. He estimated that the mansion would take 5 years to complete and barring a small delay when the initial construction company had to be changed at Spencer's request, the project was soon underway. Trevor constructed a manor that would be at the same time beautiful and mysterious. Enthralled by the idea, he designed many of the trademark traps and secrets of the estate and when the construction of the mansion was finished, he was invited to stay there with his family. Still having a considerable amount of work to do, Trevor sent his wife and daughter to stay there before he could go himself. They themselves arrived on Friday the 10th of November, according to Lord Spencer. Arriving at the estate on Monday the 13th of November, he was told by Lord Spencer that his family had left earlier to see his aunt Emma, who was ill. But little did he know that this was a complete lie. He had dinner alone with Lord Spencer, not knowing they were actually being subjected to experiments with the prototype progenitor virus. On Tuesday, November 14th, Trevor was given the official tour of the mansion, where he was baffled by Lord Spencer's collection of medieval suits of armor, Da Vinci paintings, and Raphael statues. It was on this day also that Lord Spencer made reference to his intention to open a pharmaceutical corporation, that corporation was Umbrella, and that he would use the house as a private hotel for his employees. This puzzled Trevor, however, who was expecting the mansion to be a private retreat for Lord Spencer, alone evident by the total secrecy of the mansion's construction. While wandering around the mansion on the 18th of November, Trevor began to constantly notice things that were either out of place or not supposed to exist. The most notable incident was when he observed a deep hole behind the artificial waterfall. These were to be the foundations of the laboratory just being built there. White-robed men smelling of disinfectant escorted Trevor away from the courtyard. They had been following him around the mansion for quite some time. On Monday the 20th of November, Trevor lost his lighter believing it to be in the room with the hunting rifle, which related to a ceiling booby trap in RE1 Remake and RE1 Original, he checked there, only to find that it had disappeared. Making his concerns about the trip known to Lord Spencer, Trevor notified him of his intention to depart the following day. That following day, Trevor was observing paintings with Lord Spencer and one of the white-robed men from before, the paintings were a man's progression through life. At this point, one of the men turned to him and said, Right about now, your family is... At that point, Trevor was knocked unconscious from another man behind him and locked up in a room. It was on Friday, the 24th, after three days of captivity, that he realized the truth. He and Lord Spencer were the only ones aware of the mansion's secrets, and Lord Spencer wanted him dead as a liability. 
he made his preparations to escape. As he tried and was horrified to find one of his wife's shoes lying around in the mansion, his memory affected after being drugged, he struggled to remember the many puzzles he had devised, such as the tiger eyes and the gold emblem. He tried to escape via a secret network of underground tunnels he had devised as a last ditch escape route, but he found himself no way out. After running from the guards for several days, Trevor was forced to go into hiding into one of the unfinished passages. Hungry and severely weakened, he could not remember the majority of the secrets he had designed himself, and was tortured by the knowledge he had dragged his family into a nest of vipers. Scurrying away to the hidden corridor, he jumped into a pit that led to the secret path. His path was blocked by a heavy stone he could not move. Touching it in the pit of darkness, he knew there were letters engraved into the plaque. Lighting his last match, he saw his own name inscribed into the tombstone. Realizing it was his ultimate fate to die in that manner, he collapsed. Trapped in the pit with no hope of escape and pleading in his diary to his wife and daughter to forgive him, he quit struggling and finally died of thirst and starvation in the inescapable corridor. Following his disappearance in 1967, his designs continued to be copied by others to cater to the wishes of other aristocrats, like the mansion built at the request of Alexander Ashford in Antarctic base, and like I said, the Queen Zenobia, Dido, and Samaribus. Pleading for forgiveness from his family, these were the last known words from George Trevor in his diary. November 24th, 1967, and I quote, 11 days have passed since arriving on this estate. How did I end up like this? A guy in a lab coat came with a plate of skimpy meal and said to me, sorry to put you through this, but it's for security reasons. That's when it hit me. It all makes sense now. There are only two people that know the secret of this mansion, Sir Spencer and myself. If they kill me, Sir Spencer will be the only person that knows the secret. But for what purpose? It doesn't matter now. It's too dangerous here. My family, I hope they are alright. I've decided to escape. Jessica, Lisa, I pray you are safe. November 26th, 1967. How could I be so careless? I lost my favorite lighter, the one Jessica gave me for my birthday. Now it's going to be much harder to get out of this dark place. November 13th, the day when my fate was sealed, my aunt was hospitalized just three days before. Jessica and Lisa said they were going to visit her. I wish I could be there with them. But wait. Even as I'm writing, my memory is coming back to me more vividly. Just before I passed out, I remember the men in the collab saying something like, Most likely your family is already. I pray for their safety. November 27th, 1967. Somehow I managed to get out of that room. But getting out of this mansion won't be as easy. I have to get past all the booby traps. Tiger eyes, gold emblem. I have to try and remember for my own sake. November 29th, 1967. I can't get out. I have tried every possible way to escape, but only to be faced with the reality that I'm trapped. I've been everywhere. The laboratory with the large glass tubes filled with formaldehyde, and those dark, wet, and eerie caves. What can I do? At first I didn't want to believe my eyes, but that familiar high-heeled shoe in the corridor. It was like a reflex. One name came to my mind. Jessica. I don't want to believe they share the same fate as me. No, I can't give up hope. I have to hope they're alive. November 30th, 1967. I haven't had anything to eat or drink for the past few days. I feel like I'm going crazy. Why is this happening to me? Why do I have to die like this? I was too obsessed with designing this ghastly mansion. I should have known better. November 31st, 1967. It was a dark and damp underground tunnel and another dead end, but even in the darkness something caught my eye. Carefully, I lit my last match and I had to see what it was. A grave. But deeply engraved into the stone was my name, George Trevor. At that instant, it all became clear to me. Those bastards knew from the beginning that I'd die here and I fell right into their trap. But it's too late now. I'm losing it. Everything is becoming so far away. Jessica, Lisa, forgive me. Because of my ego, I got both of you involved in this whole damn conspiracy. Forgive me. May God justify my death in exchange for your safety. George Trevor. One of the things that really makes this story about George really sad to me is that he didn't know the fate of his family, which was Jessica and Lisa. But was it actually better to not know about their fate, especially with what Spencer did to his daughter? If you are in George's shoes, would you have rather have known about their fates or would you rather have wanted it to be unknown? Because of what they did to Lisa, in my opinion, I personally would rather have let it be unknown. Because now, even though that this story about George was dark, everything gets a lot more darker and worse. Lisa Trevor was born around 1953 to George and Jessica. 
Nine years later, when they were invited to the Spencer Mansion, they went before George because he was caught up with work and was unable to go. So Jessica drove on to the mansion with Lisa, where they planned to stay over the week until George arrived. Arriving at the mansion around Friday the 10th of November, the two were immediately detained by Spencer's security guards and taken into an underground cavern below the estate. There, Jessica and Lisa were injected with the type A and type B strains of the progenitor virus. A newly discovered retrovirus Spencer believed would be useful for eugenics, but which required alteration to successfully mutate a human. Over the next few days, both were subjected to further testing while their mental state deteriorated, likely the onset of brain damage as an effect of the progenitor disease. While Jessica made plans for a breakout on Monday the 13th of November, her poor reaction to the virus deemed her as a failed experiment, which led to her immediate execution, which prevented any hope of Lisa escaping. Unlike her mother, however, Lisa's body reacted much better to the progenitor infection, and she developed a degree of superhuman strength, though not to the extent a properly engineered progenitor strain would have accomplished. And this is where everything got worse. As Lisa's mental deterioration worsened, and she longed for her mother, a Spencer employee was tasked to impersonate Jessica and keep her satisfied, albeit with little success. On Wednesday the 15th of November, Lisa's deterioration reached a critical state in spite of her enhanced abilities, and she went into a violent outburst during dinner with the impersonator. When Lisa realized the deception, she believed the woman had stolen Jessica's face, and she attempted to cut it off and give it back to her mother. It was uncertain if the woman died from these lacerations, but we will assume that she did. Over the next few several days, Lisa's mental state worsened further, with her diary suggesting she had briefly escaped the lab following the attack. Her claims of having found the graves of both her parents cannot be reconciled with known events. However, as George was at this time still alive, she did find her mother's grave, but was unable to open it as it was sealed shut by a heavy stone slab. Over the next 28 years, Lisa remained beneath the estate, and was moved into the Arclay Laboratory upon its completion. Her existence was kept a company secret, with none of the researchers at the facility knowing her name, and few even knowing she existed at all. Over this period, Lisa continued to deteriorate, following into a stupor, though kept chained to her bed in the event she recovered. For much of the first 20 years, she was fed through intravenous therapy, and transported by wheelchair if she needed to be moved. In 1988, Lisa was selected to be the host of the NE type parasite. These parasites had been engineered by Umbrella Europe to replace the brain functions in a BOW to improve performance, but had a low success rate. During the surgical implantation, however, Lisa's immune system attacked the organism and destroyed it. Her consciousness was restored with a certain degree of intelligence after this event. But searching for an explanation, William Birkin isolated a progenitor mutant strain entirely distinct from the T-virus she had previously been tested with. Over the next seven years, Lisa Trevor became a hindrance to the research. With her mind somewhat restored, she was once more able to use her enhanced strength and her obsessiveness need to collect faces, making her a danger to all women in the facility. Following the deaths of three researchers in 1995, the executives had had enough, and orders were given from the Umbrella Security Service to execute her. Owing to her regenerative abilities, the USS waited three days before declaring her deceased and her body was taken away for disposal. Her disposal was handled by Dr. Birkin's successor, Dr. John Clemens. And for those that who don't know about John, this was Ada's quote-unquote boyfriend in Resident Evil 2. So with what happened to those three researchers, whenever Lisa found a female that didn't match her mother's face, she would rip it off and wear it on top of her own. She was used as a guinea pig for numerous viral experiments for a period of over 20 years, and her body withstood them all resulting in a curious side effect of her becoming practically immortal. But at the exact same time, Lisa was severely deformed and her true face was mostly hidden beneath her collection of face masks she wore of withered human skin. Her skull became exposed through the flesh and her nose had completely sunken into her face. Her mouth and gums had receded, revealing rotten teeth and one of her eyes was missing. She also had a crooked spine and developed a hunchback. A curious effect brought out by the nemesis parasite latching onto her spinal cord and bending and twisting it over time. Whenever she was in danger or attacking other people, numerous tentacles would sprout from her face and body, another sign of the nemesis parasite doing its work. In addition to all this, she developed a huge tumor on her back with an eyeball, a typical trait of G-virus infection. She was dressed in a tattered old hospital gown and a bit to conceal her hideous form and samples of her contaminated DNA were used to further develop the G-virus over time. 
The various treatments she had received over the years had developed her natural immune system to the extent that she was practically invulnerable. She was impervious to all forms of gunfire and even lethal injection failed to dispose of her. Intelligence-wise, her mind had regressed to that of an infant. By now, it was doubtful she could remember her name or anything about herself other than her internal quest to find her mother. She was still capable of basic speech, though her main method of communication was to wail and bang her chains around. However, she did retain enough faculties to build a crude home beneath an abandoned cabin and fill it with dolls and childhood memories. She would attack others by swiping her hands and using her wooden shackles as a club. During the 1998 biohazard at the mansion, Lisa managed to get out of confinement and into the living areas of the estate, encountering the STARS members several times. She was first thought to have perished when she finally recovered the skull of Jessica from the crypt and flung herself off into a chasm. But again, she survived and crawled back up to ground level. She later encountered Albert Wesker and began to stalk him across the grounds, perhaps recognizing his face as one of those who had experimented on her all those years ago. Eventually, she was pinned down by a fallen chandelier, then engulfed by the explosion that destroyed the mansion. Lisa Trevor was never heard from again, and finally her long suffering was at an end. But however, we are going to switch it to a different point of view, and that is Albert Wesker's in Wesker's report. Now, the first part of the report basically ends up showing on how fascinated William Birkin was with the Ebola virus, but mostly I am going to get to the parts of where it mentions Lisa Trevor and from Wesker's point of view on how they were injecting her with multiple viruses and such. And I quote, the reason Birkin was so interested in the Ebola virus was that he was thinking of recombining the Ebola genes into a starter virus to strengthen its attributes. By the time we had arrived at the research center, there was already a sample of the Ebola virus waiting for us. We changed elevators several times and finally reached the upper level of the complex. When we arrived, even Birkin looked up. It was the first time that we had met, quote unquote, her. We hadn't heard a single word about her before. She was a secret of the utmost confidentially at the research center, and they didn't let any information about her out of the compound. According to the records, she was at the research center from the very moment it was first built. She was 25, but we didn't know her name nor why she was here. She was to be used as the experimental subject host for the T-Virus. The day we began the experiment was November 10th, 1967. We did T-Virus experiments on her for all of 11 years. Birkin mumbled something. Maybe there were words cursing our situation, maybe there were words of praise. In any case, we had to come to the point of no return now. We had two choices, to succeed in our research, or to lay here rotting like she was. Of course, that meant we only had one option. She was bound to a quote-unquote pipe bed, and something about her made me think. Had this been a part of Spencer's plan all along? The second part of the report basically summarizes the time where Alexia Ashford ended up showing up to the mansion as well. So again, I'm going to be skipping to the part where they do end up mentioning Lisa, and it's going to be like that for every single part of Wesker's report. And this was three years after the first report came out. Birkin's pace was quickened by Alexia's existence. He began to act out of the ordinary. He would stay at the lab for 24 hours straight attempting experiments that he hadn't really thought out. I tried to use other researchers to get as many samples from the subjects before they died, but I just couldn't keep up with his pace. The head facilitator brought in a new subject as if nothing had ever happened, but she too soon died. It was hell. And within that hell, there was but one living person, the female test subject's body that continued to live on. She was already 28 years old, having lived 14 of her years in this research facility. Someone whose consciousness had been taken away by the starter virus that had been injected into her 14 years ago. Someone who, if their heart hadn't happened to actually be alive, would only hope for death, but she continued to survive. Why was only she able to survive this long? Her basic experiment data and that of other subjects seemed to be the same. It would take a long time for us to solve this riddle. The report continues two years later. The third part of the report basically summarizes Alexia's death and also, again, just going to continue skipping to the part where Lisa is showcased in this report. I felt no love lost for throwing away my position as a researcher in order to find out, but I couldn't rush things because if Spencer ever got wind to what I was doing, then it would be all over. I jumped back into my research and it was business as usual, so as not to call attention to my plans. During those times, the female test subject that continued to survive was left in some corner and forgotten. A living could have been. We began to call her that sometime after she stopped yielding useful data for us. At least until five years later, that is. Part 4 of Wesker's report summarizes the Nemesis plan and what they were going to do with it. The package from Europe came at midnight. Several days later, after a series of broadcasts, proposals, and counterproposals, 
That box that contained it landed on the helicopter pad. It read Nemesis Prototype. I had to use some very strong tactics to get the incomplete thing where it was being researched in France, but all the while Spencer was backing me up, pulling all of his strings and using his influence. Only Birkin showed no interest in it until the end, but he at least recognized it as an important part of the experiment. The sample was developed to create a never before seen totally new form. By manipulating genes they had artificially created a living parasite. That was what Nemesis really was. It could latch onto other organisms' brains and then take control of the host's brain, bringing it to a high level of destructive power. By combining intelligence with a destructive body suitable for battle, they were able to form the ultimate biological weapon. Of course, we used her as our test subject. Surely her unusually high endurance would be perfect for sustaining the Nemesis prototype parasite for a long time. Even if she didn't last that long, it's not as if we would be losing anything special anyways. However, the experiment yielded a result that was opposite from what I was predicting. The nemesis parasite that tried to enter her brain disappeared. At first, I didn't even know what was going on. I couldn't believe that she would be the one to mix with the parasite genes without dying. That was the beginning. Somewhere within that undying body of hers, there had been a change. We had to re-examine her from head to toe one more time. During our 10 years of research, she had been totally and thoroughly examined, but this time we ignored that previous data. For the 21 years that she had been here for the first time, something was finally happening. After she had already survived longer than other subjects who had received the Nemesis virus, it was only Birkin that started to realize what was happening. There was something within her. That something was a deviation from the T-Virus plan. Something new that gave way to a new form. Something that changed our destiny. It was the beginning of the G-Virus plan. The fifth and final part of the report summarizes the G-Virus plan and and the end it does showcase on what they ended up doing to Lisa after she was either no use or was just out of control. A man named John, Birkin's successor and new chief researcher, was waiting there for us. He came from a research center in Chicago and was supposedly a very talented scientist but he was a little too straight to be working at a place like this. He began to question the inhumanity of what was going on in the labs and made his opinions known to the upper evil executives. I had heard rumors about him at the information section. Everyone seemed to agree that if any information ever leaked out, he probably would have been the culprit. We ignored John and kept on walking and then began the final disposal procedures on her. You must kill her. Due to her being infected with Nemesis, although only a minor amount, she started to think and become conscious. She started to act in grotesque ways. Her behavior has continued to escalate and now she wears the face of another woman that she peeled off just like a mask. According to reports, she acted in the same way after they gave her the first starter virus. I don't know why she began to act in such a way, but because she recently killed three researchers, they have decided to dispose of her. Now that the G research is on the right track, there is no real use for a test subject like her. After constantly checking and reconfirming for three days the fact that she was dead, her corpse was, as per facility head's order, taken away somewhere. In the end, I never did find out who she was and why she was brought here. Of course, she was merely a test subject. But still though, if she hadn't been here, then there wouldn't have been any G-Plan and Birkin and I would probably be leading different lives now. I left the Arclay Research Center thinking that very thing. I wonder how much of this was according to Spencer's plan. Three years later, the incident began. Imagine being a young girl going to a mansion your father was working on only to be taken hostage and ejected with a virus. Your mother dies and your father was lied to and was unaware of what happened to you and his wife. Your body was used as a test subject and for almost 30 years you were being tortured and never died. Meaning you were suffering endlessly and your body was decaying as years go by. Looking for your mother while she was dead and your father suffered the same fate all at the hands of Oswald Spencer which in this story really shows on how much of a monster he truly was. George was better off not knowing what they did to his daughter because if I was in his shoes like before, I wouldn't want to know. I would rather have Lisa have a quick death, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. Even in Wesker's report, he was kind of puzzled of how Spencer was and how he moved. And honestly, it's just terrifying to know he did that to the Trevor family. I've heard a lot of things about the Winters family having the saddest story, but in all honesty, once I heard this story, the Winters family just fails in comparison to the Trevor family. This story gave me chills and made me freeze and just question as to how evil Spencer was. It was an unfortunate fate for that family and easily the saddest, most heartbreaking and darkest story in Resident Evil history. But of course, those words are only a small sample size as to what you can describe this. But as always everyone, thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this very long lore video, 
be sure to leave a like on this video and hit that subscribe button if you are new to the channel. I'm trying to hit 10,000 subscribers before the end of the year, and I would really appreciate it if you guys hit that big red button. It's totally free, and hopefully this video convinces you to do that. I hope you guys have yourselves a good day, good night, and a good sleep, and I'll catch you guys in my next video. Peace out, and much love.